Hello everyone and welcome to this Flexitricity webinar, Seven Steps for Accessing Demand Response Revenue. My name is Phil Newman and thank you for joining us today. Our goal for this webinar is to arm you with the facts about demand response and we plan to keep the presentation to 15 minutes. We will respond to questions at the end and you can use the uh, info at flexitricity.com email address or the feature within GoToWebinar to submit your questions. We'll respond at the end and afterwards there will be a recording available of the webinar in its entirety. There is a four page guide as you can see there and we'll make sure that that's available for you at the end. And what I'd like to do now is hand over to Dr. Alistair Martin who is our founder and Chief Strategy Officer. Alistair, I'll leave you to talk everyone through the facts about demand response. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, okay, so this is a fairly quick gallop through uh, the way that we uh, uh, work in Flexitricity and uh, the way that revenue is obtained from demand response services. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is show you a little graphic um, that sort of tries to tie it all together. Um, just looking at the top left of that, um, what we're trying to represent there is the national electricity system. And uh, the circumstance there, um, if you can imagine that we're, we have a demand peak that perhaps hasn't been adequately forecast, or possibly a power station failure that's, that wasn't expected. And, and, and that um, immediately, going on to uh, uh, blob two, takes you to the system operator, the transmission system operator, i.e. national grid, who suddenly realizes that there's a situation that has to be dealt with rapidly. Now, what happens then uh, in uh, uh, blob three is that Flexitricity will receive an electronic instruction from National Grid Control telling us to turn up generation and turn down electricity consumption uh, rapidly. And that generally means over a time scale of a few minutes. So we do that by accessing through virtual private networks uh, the, uh, the assets of uh, participating industrial and commercial electricity consumers. And that may be by starting their generators or turning down their consumption, depending on various uh, uh, constraints that we work with that I'll deal with later. And the result of that in Blob 4 is that the national system is brought back into balance, the crisis is dealt with, and that gives National Grid time to tee up the other options that it needs um, in order to carry the system forward in a more normal way. And once that uh, period is over, we will receive the cease and, and life goes back to normal. Um, there are two effects that follow from that. Um, Blob 5 um, shows one of them, and that is that by providing a reserve service to National Grid by this method, uh, we don't, uh, or rather, National Grid does not have to hold that same capacity available using other sources, and those other sources would be, generally speaking, part loading at fossil fuel power stations, which is an inefficient way to operate fossil fuel power stations, and uh, therefore, um, uh, by providing reserve, we reduce carbon emissions in the national electricity system. Um, the second thing in on Blob 6 uh, is that uh, by effectively making the electricity consumer uh, flexible, um, we create more space for renewable generation and essentially uh, help to enable the low carbon economy, um, and um, which is what obviously we're all uh, trying to do. Um, just moving on to look at how that works in practice, this is uh, one particular event um, from, from a number of years ago. It's actually a fairly typical event for us. Um, what you see here, hopefully, is from midnight to midnight, one day of electricity consumption. And you can see how the, the consumption was, was provided through nuclear, coal, and gas in, in different colors. At, uh, at, at, at 34 minutes past four in the afternoon, a nuclear power station failed. And uh, that immediately, as it was just before the evening peak, put the system into crisis. Within four minutes of that, we received an instruction from National Grid Control to start generation and turn down consumption, which we did. Within five minutes, we were at full power on various sites. And uh, National Grid held us in that mode for just over an hour before we received the, the cease. And of course, that carried the system through the evening peak despite, despite the loss of that nuclear station. That's relatively common. Um, there, are, there are other circumstances that uh, give rise to um, what this is, which is a short-term operating reserve call, a store call. So why does that create revenue? Well, it's a service, a service provided to National Grid. Uh, and uh, there are various services that we provide to uh, utilities. Uh, the main ones are, are, are listed there. Store is the largest. Um, but generally speaking, the various services tend to provide revenue in the same sorts of ways, although there are variations between them. Um, availability payments are for making capacity available, and they're paid um, d during periods of availability, regardless of whether or not an event actually occurs. 
utilization payments are for delivered energy and those relate to the ad hoc requirements to actually turn up generation or turn down consumption. And uh, the, the, the revenue flows from, uh, to, to us from the utility and from, from, from us to the participating industrial and commercial consumers who, who receive the lion's share of the, of the service revenues. Um, we started with an example involving National Grid, uh, just to say that that's not the only uh, revenue source by any means. One particular new one uh, is uh, the distribution network operators in various different ways are um, uh, trialing various smart grid technologies in, in order for them to learn how smart grid infrastructure can help them manage their networks and uh, uh, help to absorb the low carbon, uh, facilitate the low carbon economy. Um, through the Low Carbon Networks Fund. These projects are uh, running. There are several large ones. We're involved in uh, uh, the, the majority of those. And uh, depending on the location of a site, it's possible for that site to access additional revenues, um, which uh, uh, can also contribute to the, the business case for smart grid um, uh, involvement. But it's not all about money. Um, there are other uh, things which uh, are affected by uh, participating in demand response and the smart grid. Um, the, 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 the two largest to mention would probably be um, the effect on asset reliability. And this particularly uh, relates to one particular class of demand response asset, and that would be standby generators, where reliability could be substantially improved by this sort of participation. I'll come back to that point. Um, the, the, the other one worth bringing out is the effect on national emissions of carbon dioxide. I mentioned earlier that demand response uh, creates a reserve service which reduces the need to hold coal and gas stations at part load or in hot standby. Just to uh, provide a number on that, we estimate that that is worth between 300 and 750 tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions uh, which would otherwise occur where we're not providing reserve for each megawatt we provide for each year. Um, so obviously over a, a, a large and growing portfolio that does multiply up um, substantially. So just now drilling into particular asset types and uh, their role in the smart grid and in demand response. Standby generators are the easiest to explain. Um, they sit doing nothing for most of the year and occasionally we use them to provide demand response. And even more occasionally they may provide a cover for a, a mains failure at a site. The latter activity of course has priority. Um, what we do with standby generators uh, actually probably creates the biggest positive um, improvement in core business operations, i.e. the biggest non-money benefit um, of anything that we do. Uh, and that is because we uh, place them in a role for national grid and in triad management where they perhaps run between 50 and 100 hours per year. Um, and in doing so, they're tested on load. They have a test and exercise regime which is entirely suitable um, for, for, for that type of asset. And this um, deals with the, the major problem of standby generators, which is that if they are neglected, they do not work. Um, and that is a pro point that I'm quite prepared to be quite, quite bold about. Um, test and exercise is vital for, for standby reliability. Just to put some, some numbers on that, we have a, a PDF which shows the, the um, summary card that hopefully you can see on screen just now. Um, we can distribute these uh, on request. Going to a different asset type at the other end of the scale, um, combined heat and power generators, um, I've, I've lumped in small hydro uh, to this. That they, there, are, uh, there are strong analogies which I won't go into here. Um, but uh, with CHP, what we're doing is all, it's all about finding the flexibility in and around the day job of, of that asset. The, a CHP asset has heat customers which it must serve. Um, and uh, around that, there will be some flexibility depending on the num type and size and number of prime movers and the thermal inertia or heat storage that's available. Um, and the result of that is that availability for reserve services can, as, 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 an, as an adjunct to core business operations um, varies seasonally and uh, day by day. What we do is we find the flexibility and we optimize the role of the, of the CHP in uh, uh, reserve in and around the day job. This per hour of availability creates probably the biggest return um, for, for, for an asset uh, involved in the smart grid and that's because uh, these are relatively low cost um, assets to, to operate and we can generally use them for the majority of short term operating reserve calls if not all of them. 
And again, we have a, a something of a, a summary card which we can we can distribute, and you can see uh, the difference in uh, uh, in finance there comparing to the uh, to the diesel um, side of it. Something rather different: diesel rotary uninterruptible power supplies. These are systems which uh, those who have them know about them, and many others um, would not be aware of this technology. Uh, but it's, they're so special and so unique that we created a new service um, tailored for them, which we, we call Frontline. Um, Frontline is, technically speaking, a frequency response uh, service. And um, of all the things that we do, this one creates the smallest change to the operational uh, behavior of these assets because the types of uh, incidents that we are um, deploying them against uh, from National Grid's viewpoint uh, are ones that they would uh, have a contribution to anyway as part of their day job. Um, so this is uh, operationally um, very undisruptive. Uh, and that's obviously very important because drops units tend to be deployed on the most critical of loads. Again, a summary card um, giving you an idea of the, the financial um, situation there as well. Um, and uh, we tend to recommend that drops units have relatively limited running uh, as part of uh, in, in their uh, demand response role. Um, and obviously that has an effect on the revenue, uh, but it depends on the site and we can generally tailor the approach for the site. But of course, it doesn't all have to be generation. Load reduction or load management, that is to say, delivering load reductions for short periods when the national electricity system uh, or the local electricity network hits a period of stress is just as valid. What we uh, ensure that we do is to uh, make sure that any load reduction asset participating with us is doing so only within the constraints of keeping up the quality of core business operations. So if you can imagine uh, a cold store participating in demand response, if it were the case that the temperatures within that cold store were at a level where a demand response event would threaten the quality of service provided to that cold store's customers, then uh, under our system, that cold store would automatically opt itself out of demand response. And of course, um, the uh, site staff have the ability to manually opt out as well. Uh, this, the same is true, in fact, of all of the generation types of demand response, but it's particularly important uh, in, in these circumstances. The, uh, the, one of the things that we do in, in aggregation, one of the effects of that is that we have the ability to absorb a very large range of site sizes. Uh, you can see that we span two orders of magnitude in our uh, uh, site size there, and the individual entities participating in load management can be, can be quite small. Um, load management is probably, in most cases, the simplest to install of all of the demand response options. And as before, we have a summary card that uh, explains um, some of the ranges that, 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 of revenue and um, durations that might apply. Obviously, these are tailored to the individual site. I've mentioned triads a couple of times. It's probably it's worthwhile just mentioning what they, they, they are. It's essentially the system by which the transmission network is paid for by industrial and commercial electricity users. All half-hourly electricity customers already pay triad charges. And to reduce demand during these periods or to, to export electricity from the site um, generates a, a saving or a revenue, uh, respectively. Um, however, the, uh, the triad system has been deliberately set up um, to uh, make it uh, somewhat difficult for people to know exactly when uh, winter peak loads are going to occur, um, with the result that um, it's, it's valuable making quite a lot of effort to identify those and to reduce demand. We have a 100% record um, to date in analyzing and forecasting and picking out when the triad periods are going to be, and we do that without um, uh, excessively regular uh, running of generators or turning down of load. It's a difficult balancing act, um, but it's one that we manage alongside uh, the other reserve services. 